revolution creates seismic shifts in power and ideology. At the end of the 20th century, two revolutions set the destiny of the 21st. Romania, which defined the collapse of Soviet communism in Europe, and Iran, which heralded the rebirth of Islam as a potent force for political change. Based on eyewitness accounts, this is a dramatized reconstruction of these events as they happened, on two days that shook the world. It is December 1989. In Paris, the world-renowned playwright Samuel Beckett has died. In America, President George Bush has ordered the US Marines to invade Panama. And in Eastern Europe, it is seven weeks since the fall of the Berlin Wall. Revolution has swept through Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, and Hungary. Romania is the last remaining communist state, but it too is on the brink of revolution. It is Christmas Day, 1989. For a quarter of a century, Romania has been in the iron grip of an oppressive communist regime. For the last week, the country has witnessed a violent wave of uprisings against its dictatorial leader, Nicolae Ceausescu. Like many Romanians who've spent all their lives under communist rule, Captain Ionel Boero of the Romanian Paratroop Regiment has never celebrated Christmas before. In Bucharest, Boero's wife is keen to get in touch as the country suddenly seems to be on the verge of civil war. Hello? Hello, good evening. He wishes he could be with his family, but as all military personnel are on standby, he's not allowed to contact them. For three days, fierce fighting has engulfed several towns, and President Ceausescu and his wife, Elena, appear to have fled the capital. Bucharest. What Boero doesn't know is that today his own fate will be closely bound with that of his president. In a suburb of Bucharest, television director George Minitaru boosts morale by bringing his team an unusual breakfast, coffee, freshly looted from Communist Party stores. The station has always been used by the Communist government to transmit its own propaganda. From the start of the troubles, the new service has declared the uprisings as the work of foreign agitators. Militaru has no choice in this. It is simply his job to report events in this way. The station is therefore an obvious target for attack. Secretly, Militaru is not sure how much longer they can hold out, but pretends it's business as usual. Contrary to rumor, the Ceausescus have not fled Romania. They are being secretly held in a military barracks 50 kilometers from Bucharest. Whether they are under arrest or are there for their own protection is unclear. For the third day in a row, they refused the standard army rations they were responsible for introducing. Elena is worried about the strain recent events have put on Nikolai's failing health. Nikolai suffers from diabetes and has bladder problems. The toilet facilities are basic. It is in stark contrast to the opulence they have enjoyed for the past 24 years. The Ceausescus are rumored to have millions stashed in Swiss banks. They have requisitioned royal palaces and luxury villas all around the country, which they have decorated in the style of Versailles. Most, they have never even spent the night in. Now, they are about to pay the price for their greed and their vanity. With all of Romania in chaos, Captain Boeru has no idea what his duties will be today. 
A senior officer appears in the mess. He asks for eight men to volunteer for a special mission. He tells them that it will be for their families and for their future. Boero feels duty-bound to sign up. Yeah. At Toga Vishte barracks, the Ceausescus are taken from their room. The night before, the barracks were shot at, and the presence of the Ceausescus is making the guards nervous. They're being hidden in an armored car for their protection, although they are confident they are to be flown to freedom. Nikolai and Elena have always believed they are invincible. They've worked hard to build a cult of personality around themselves and have set about creating a country that worships them. Nikolai confers on himself the title Genius of the Carpathians and the Great Conducatore, whilst the barely literate Elena becomes the great scientist, engineer and academician. In contrast, ordinary Romanians are struggling. The economy has all but collapsed, people are hungry, and the secret police, the Securitate, instills a climate of fear. The touch paper has been lit on Romania's troubles a week before, when human rights protests took place in the provincial city of Timisoara. The army and Securitate forces opened fire on the unarmed crowd. Under the command of General Victor Stankulescu, government security forces cause over 90 deaths in Timisoara. Two days after the initial protests on the 18th of December, General Stankulescu is still ordering the shooting of those involved in the demonstrations. As Deputy Defense Minister, Stan Kulescu has won the trust of the Ceausescus. Nikolai himself ordered the general to take control of the situation in Timisoara, knowing that he would do so with efficiency and brutality. But what now cannot be done is to halt the rumors of genocide that follow in the wake of the massacre and which spread uncontrollably across Romania. On the 21st of December, and in direct response to the bloodshed in Timisoara, President Ceausescu prepares to make his first public appearance since the massacre. Ceausescu plans a morale-boosting rally of over 100,000 people in central Bucharest. He is confident that this will put an end to the crisis. His address will be broadcast across Romania from the balcony of the Central Committee building. Camera uno. George Militaru Camera has been directing Ceausescu's live speeches and TV appearances for nearly 10 years, and he knows that one wrong shot can see him sacked. He checks that the cameraman can find the planted audience members. Should Ceausescu stutter or have a facial tick, a shot of the enthusiastic crowd can immediately be inserted. As they set out for the balcony, neither Elena or Nikolai realize the extent to which Romania has changed. At exactly 12.31, Ceausescu begins his speech. It was on this same balcony in 1968 that Ceausescu had his finest hour. Romania had already negotiated limited freedoms from Soviet control in the 1950s, and as Soviet tanks rolled into Czechoslovakia in 1968, Ceausescu gave a rousing speech, condemning Moscow for threatening peace in Europe. Constitue o mare greșeală 
o primejdje grave pentru pacea în Europa, pentru soarta socialismului în lume. As a result, the good communist becomes a recognizable world statesman. Since then, he feels himself to be untouchable. Ceausescu has been speaking to the crowd for eight minutes, when the mood changes. The chant of Timișoara is heard. No one has ever dared to publicly challenge Ceausescu before. He feels puzzled and anxious, and all of Romania can see it. In the TV gallery, a lifetime of repression has made its mark, and Giorgio Militari doesn't need to be told. He immediately cuts the live broadcast. The pictures vanish from the screen, but in the studio, someone keeps recording the sound from the balcony. The damage has been done. The image of a frail, confused old man is the catalyst to bring thousands of Romanians onto the street. General Stankulesco's worst fears have been realized. His actions have made martyrs of the victims of Timisoara and have escalated the unrest. He's now in the spotlight, in danger both from the Ceausescu's and the crowd. In the heat of the moment, he contrives a broken leg, hoping this will allow him to take a back seat during the unfolding events. It's the night following his disastrous speech, and Ceausescu is unable to sleep as the crowds take to the streets. Domio, Stankulescu. They cannot contact Stankulescu, and the army appear unwilling to follow orders to crush the protesters. At around 11 the following morning, the square is still packed with protesters hemmed in by troops and the Securitate forces defending the Central Committee building. The Ceausescu's are still inside. At noon, the demonstrators storm the Central Committee building. They meet little resistance from the army, which is now clearly supporting them. Stan Kulescu appears and takes advantage of the Ceausescu's rising panic. He tells them they must escape the building, knowing that if they flee, they will appear guilty. He calls for a helicopter, but does not go with them, using his leg as an excuse. The crowd breaks into the lower floors of the building as the Ceausescu's try to make it to the helipad. As they run across the roof, they are spotted by the jubilant protesters. The overloaded helicopter struggles to take off. Aboard are Ceausescu, Elena, two advisors, two bodyguards, and the three-man crew. The plan is to make for one of their country palaces to try to regroup and rally support. With the Ceausescu's gone, the crowd turns its attention to the television studio, keen to use the power of TV to spread word of the growing revolution. Militaro and his staff are powerless as the crowd forces its way in. Confusion reigns as the protesters negotiate their way on air. At one o'clock, 
the dissident poet and national hero, Miosur Dinescu, goes on air. News of the revolution reaches even the most rural parts of Romania, as well as the outside world. Later, it is dubbed history's TV revolution. As Bucharest is enveloped in chaos, the Ceausescu's escape is becoming farcical. The helicopter pilot invents technical problems and dumps his passengers on a deserted roadside. A local doctor driving to work spots the desperate couple and their bodyguard trying to flag down a ride. It is Elena, not Nikolai, who stops him at gunpoint. No, me, fadji, no, me. They're driven in the direction of Togoviste. In Bucharest, work is underway to form a new government. In an office deep in the Central Committee building, self-elected politicians calling themselves the National Salvation Front are trying to get hold of Stan Kulescu on the phone to secure the backing of the army in order to restore calm. But Stan Kulescu isn't answering until he knows what has happened to the Ceausescus. For the Ceausescus, though, their escape is over. After commandeering a second car, they are identified and taken to Torgoviste's army barracks. Colonel Andre Kemenich is the officer in charge at Torgoviste. He is worried that the presence of the Ceausescus makes the barracks a target for Securitate snipers. In Bucharest, Stan Kulescu hears the news of their arrest on the radio. He is now taking calls. Oddly, no one sees his plaster cast again. People are still unsure as to the whereabouts of their leaders. Fierce street battles erupt between the army, now supporting the revolution, and Securitate snipers loyal to the Ceausescus. The army and the people succeed in rounding up Securitate agents, who are then interrogated and executed. A counter-revolution begins to look less likely. On Christmas Eve, the National Salvation Front meets with General Stankulescu in Bucharest to decide the fate of the Ceausescus. They fear the Ceausescus may remain a rallying point for counter-revolutionary forces. In a stormy three-hour meeting, President-to-be, Ion Iliescu, argues for a civil trial weeks later, while General Stankulescu argues for an immediate military trial. He eventually gets his way. He has his own ideas about what sort of justice the Ceausescus deserve. On Christmas Day, five helicopters land at Togoviste barracks. General Stankulescu assembles all the personnel who are to conduct the military trial, including Captain Boero and his troopers. Stankulescu and Boero meet with Colonel Kemenich to be shown round the barracks. The general points to a wall along one side. This, he tells them, is where the execution will take place. Kemenich is shocked as he realizes that the verdict is a foregone conclusion. Buero finally understands the significance of his mission as Stankulesco orders him to lead the firing squad. The Ceausescus are taken out of the armored car they have been hidden in. They've heard the helicopters and assume they'll be flown to safety. Instead, they are escorted to the schoolroom. Inside, a grim piece of theater is played out. The Ceausescus are given a medical examination to see if they are healthy enough to stand trial. Nikolai's blood pressure is very high. Eleanor refuses to be examined, but keeps hold of the insulin delivered earlier that morning for her husband. 
Captain Buero picks three soldiers to stand alongside him in the firing squad. He cannot afford to choose anyone who might have second thoughts about executing the people who were, until three days ago, the supreme rulers of Romania. At one o'clock, the court is convened. It's the last throw of the dice for the Ceausescu's. But they aren't playing the game. Nikolai refuses to recognize the legitimacy of the court and treats the proceedings with contempt. The principal charges laid before them are genocide in Timisoara and theft of the nation's assets whilst forcing the people to live in poverty. Elena is outraged when the court strips her of all her academic titles. When asked to explain why he fled the Central Committee building, Ceausescu looks pointedly at the assembled witnesses. He begins to realize the devious role Stanculescu has played in their downfall. The court orders a recess to consider its verdict. The lives of Romania's leaders hang in the balance. Captain Buero's firing squad waits nervously to see if they'll be needed. The judgment on the Ceausescu's 25 years in power takes only 55 minutes. Captain Buero has been told to wait for Stanculescu's death sentence. But when Ceausescu emerges, Buero's feelings get the better of him. Inspection of the walls reveals over a hundred rounds of fired at the elderly couple. The firing squad has been told not to aim for Nikolai's face, so they can both verify his death and use it as propaganda. Eleanor is granted no such dignity. On Christmas night, the TV revolution delivers its gruesome climax. Viewers can see the graphic images of the Ceausescu's dead bodies. The Ceausescu's are buried in unmarked graves in the Gentia Cemetery in Bucharest. Nikolai is the only head of state to lose his life during the purge of communism from Eastern Europe. The first democratic elections in 25 years are won by the National Salvation Front, led by Ion Iliescu. He appoints General Stanculescu as defense minister, and the Securitate is reinstated. Opposition politicians, newspapers, and public demonstrations are all violently crushed. 
It is the 15th of January, 1979. In Britain, the dead are lying unburied and rubbish lines the streets as a national strike grips the country. In Pennsylvania, an emergency is declared following a radiation leak from the nuclear plant at Three Mile Island. And in Iran, months of unrest have caused 